Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Anybody agree with me with that statement this morning? I've been so blessed to be in the company of the Inglewood family and your awesome pastor, Pastor Chris Aiken, and his precious wife, Miss Jody, and they have just been such great hosts for me. And uh, his uh, executive assistant, Miss Michelle, she has just been an angel. Did y'all know that y'all have an angel working on the staff here at Inglewood? She's been such a blessing and been such a help. And so my getting here was quite a joy and quite easy, and I'm just privileged to share in this commemoration of the 20th anniversary of a horrific day, September 11th, 2001. Uh, I want to start with my reflections, as many of us have done that were there, that were here, alive at that time. And of course, there I see many precious uh, young people here that weren't even here on September 11, 2001. Uh, But I remember exactly that morning. I think it was a Tuesday morning, as I recall. I woke up at 5.30, that's what's my custom, as fire chief of Shreveport, Louisiana. And I showered and shaved and put on my Shreveport Fire Department uniform and had my quiet time with God, as was my custom in the time and still is today, by the grace of God. I left home and had breakfast at Cracker Barrel with a couple of our staff members and left Cracker Barrel and was heading to fire station number 16 where I was scheduled to ride out with the crew on engine 16 for that morning. And on the way to fire station 16, the pager went off. Remember those old pagers we used to wear back in the day? The pager went off and I took it off my belt and looked at the message that scrolled across and it said that an airplane had crashed into one of the World Trade Center towers. And so when I arrived at fire station 16, the crew was around the television, glued to the television, and watching the footage that was live on the first tower burning, when lo and behold, out of nowhere, another jetliner appeared and crashed into the second tower. We knew that the United States of America was under under attack. And in the days that followed, of course, from an emergency management perspective, we called all the fire chiefs, police chiefs, and sheriffs to our emergency operations center and began to plan out the things that we needed to do just in case there was a terrorist event in the Shreveport, Bossier Parish community area. And after that, when things began to become very, very still and quiet, I glued myself to the television watching hour after hour of footage of what was taking place in New York City and in Washington, D.C., as it relates to the Pentagon and the attacks there. And then they began to have memorial services for the firefighters and the police officers. And I had committed myself to watching C-SPAN and watching every one of those memorial services. And they did such an amazing job honoring the lives of the firefighters and police officers who had given their work. I'd given their lives for their work. I realized that I was getting into a very bad state, brothers and sisters, emotionally and psychologically. I was pretty bad off. My wife was encouraging me not to watch any more television. And all of a sudden, God gave me this idea. We need to have a local memorial service in Shreveport, Bossier City area. And so I called all the fire chiefs, police chiefs, sheriffs, and our our mayors, and everybody was on board, all the elected officials. And I had this idea. I asked the fire chiefs, hey, we need to get 343 firefighters to wear their turnout gear. And we need to get 100 law enforcement officers to wear their uniform. And we're all going to line up, all the police chiefs, fire chiefs, and elected officials will be lead, will lead the procession. And then we'll be followed by the 100 law enforcement officers and the 343 firefighters. And we'll march to the Coliseum to have our memorial service. And brothers and sisters, when we reached the Coliseum and they actually took their seats and I stood up to the podium, I looked out. And I had the picture of what 343 firefighters who died in one day and 100 law enforcement officers who died in one day actually look. And for some strange reason, because we were all there together, 
the public safety family of two parishes, Caddo Parish and Bossier Parish, a healing began to take place in my heart. And I began to reflect on some of the footage I was watching. And it was as though a voice came out of the rubble piles that they were constantly digging, trying to find some indication of one of the fallen members. And the voice said this to me, as beautiful as those funerals were, those memorial services were, and as honorable as it was for that many firefighters and law enforcement officers to die in the line of duty, that the greatest honor in our proud profession is not dying together in the line of duty, but that the greatest honor in our proud professions are living together as brothers and sisters in the line of duty. I want to challenge those of us who are public safety officers to be faithful to our continued patriotism and faith that drives us to go to work every day. And whether you know it or not, part of what's driving us to go to work is our commitment to our nation's mission statement, the preamble that says, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, and it ends with a charge, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you that this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. And we're grateful, dear God, that you have predestined us to be citizens of the United States of America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. And now, Father, we honor your presence today in this worship service and it's time for me to share the message you have given me to say. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight and be an expression of inspiration and encouragement to these, my brothers and sisters. And I'll give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk today about our calling to fulfill. Our calling to fulfill. The scripture foundation for the message today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28 and verse 29 in the New King James Version, brothers and sisters, this is how it reads. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29 says, for whom he foreknew, he did also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. There's another translation that says, of many brothers and sisters. Three of the most common questions I've discovered in the conquest of a meaningful life that leaves a legacy of faith and righteousness are, number one, what did God create me to do? Number two, what did God create me to be? And number three, what is God's plan for my life? All God's children want to know the answer to those three questions. And the answer to those questions are found in many passages of Scripture, but they are certainly found in the passage of Scripture that is the foundational text for this message today. What God created me to do is calling. What God created me to be is purpose. And fulfilling God's plan for our life, brothers and sisters, is destiny. In many cases, purpose is used as a synonym for both destiny and calling. God made us with the purpose, for a purpose, and on purpose. And they actually embrace calling, purpose, and destiny. For a purpose, in the context of this message and the scripture, is related to calling. God has something for us to do. On purpose means God created us, male and female, intentionally. It was not accidentally or randomly. And with the purpose is related to destiny, God's plan. And I've got a scriptural uh, supporter that really backs all of this up. In the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 36, it says, And David 
fulfill all the purposes of God in his life, then he died. The reference to all the purposes is indicating that David fulfilled the calling that God had on his life, David fulfilled the purpose that God had on his life, and David fulfilled the plan, the destiny that God had for his life, and then David died. So there are three points I want to bring out in the message our calling to fulfill. And the first one is the significance of calling. And the big idea behind this first point is to fulfill our calling, we must be faithful to God's plan and faithful to our purpose. Calling, brothers and sisters, is what God created us to do. So a career in the military as a soldier, a Marine, or, or, an, or an, a Navy uh, person, someone in the Navy, uh, in, in those, the military, those are callings. A uh, career in law enforcement as a police officer is a calling. A career in the fire and rescue service is a calling. A career as a paramedic is a calling. And I would even go so far just to make sure we're in the context, a career as a teacher is a calling, a career as a lawyer is a calling, a career as an electrician is a calling. For sons and daughters of God, what God created us to do in our vocations, brothers and sisters, is a calling. As it relates to public safety, some of us realize our callings when we were just kids. Some of us realize our callings when we were going through the recruit academy, through basic training, while others of us realized our calling when we made an emergency call and while we were serving and doing, performing our duties in that emergency call, we realized that this career, this vocation is what God created me to do. God revealed to me my calling when I was five years old. We were living in Shreveport, Louisiana in a back alley in a shotgun house and we heard sirens in our alley. My three big brothers, two little sisters and me, we were laying on the living room floor of our little shotgun house watching a little small black and white TV with a coat hanger sticking out of the top of it, watching the Andy Griffith show. I remember that very, very vividly. And so we sprang to our feet, opened the front door, and there was a big red fire truck in front of our house. Miss Maddie, who lived across the alley, her house was on fire. And I looked at my mom and my brothers and sisters and I said, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. I was just five years old. And because our callings come from God, listen to this, our callings are divine assignments. They are divine assignments because they came from God. And because a calling is a divine assignment, listen to this, we are supposed to be able to do things in the context of our callings that people who have the same vocation who are not called are not supposed to be able to do. There should be, listen to this, a distinction between first responders who are the called and first responders who are not the called. Because the scripture says to those of us who are called, it is God at work in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So there should be a distinction between those of us who are the called and those who are not the called according to Ephesians 3, 19 through 20, because we are filled with all the fullness of God. And because as first responders, we do what we do unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to to the power that works on the inside of us. I think about one of my favorite characters in the Bible, which is King David. How is it, brothers and sisters, think about it, that a teenage boy as a shepherd could kill a lion and a bear with his bare hands because he had a power working on the inside of him in his calling as a shepherd that gave him the capacity to do what other shepherds who would not call were not able to do. How was he able to kill a Philistine giant as a teenage boy? Because he had a calling on his life that gave him a power to do something that was greater than any other teenage boy was able to do. God makes a distinction between firefighters, police officers, EMTs, military soldiers, teachers, you name the profession that are the called and those who are not the call because he wants his sons and daughters to be standing out differently 
than everybody else who is in that same calling. Did I spend enough time trying to make that point? Probably a little bit too much time. So to be successful in our calling, we must be faithful to God, recognizing that our careers are divine assignments that come from Him. Calling is what we were created to do, brothers and sisters, for God's glory. Calling is not what we are doing for God. Calling is what God is doing in and through us in our professions. God called us because those of us who in military and public safety, he called us because he knew there was going to be wars. God knew there was going to be crimes. God knew there were going to be fires. He called EMTs and paramedics because he knew there was going to be heart attacks and strokes and mothers were going to be delivering babies and they were not going to be able to make it to the hospital. He knew that people's hearts would stop beating and pulses would stop and they would be need, that it would be necessary for them to be resuscitated and to brought, be brought back to life. And so he made sons and daughters, soldiers and police officers and firefighters and EMTs so that they would be the answer to the prayers and the promises that people have made to him to rescue and to save and to protect. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? We are God's hand extended, angels on earth in public safety. God's plan not only included what he created us to do, he also created and included what he created us to be. So here's point number two, the significance of purpose. And the big idea behind point number two is to fulfill our calling, we must be faithful to our purpose in family relationships. God created us. When he created us, he knew exactly what he wanted us to be. And in the text it says, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn of many sons and daughters. God made us brothers and sisters because he wanted a family. God wanted a family. And he predestined us to be his family members. And in the family of God, listen, there are only sons and daughters. There's only two genders in the, in the family of God. Sons and daughters. And he predestined those of us who are guys, males, because he wanted us to be his, his sons. He predestined those of you who are females because he wanted you to be his daughters. And he wanted lots of sons and daughters. So he created holy matrimony between a man and a woman so that they could procreate lots of sons and daughters. There's only sons and daughters in the family of God. And God has no grandchildren, so all of us are God's children, his sons and daughters. That's why it's so natural for me to look at you, many of you I've never seen before for the first time, and call you my brothers and sisters, because we are in the family of God. Whenever we allow our calling to actually have a priority over our purpose, we will not fulfill the maximum intent of our calling in God. What am I trying to say? To the guys, because you were born to be a son of God, to honor God, brothers, you have to be faithful to your mother and father. If you have brothers and sisters, to honor God, you have to be a faithful brother to your sisters and brothers. When you get married, you ought to be a faithful husband to your wife. When your wife has children, you have to be a faithful father to your children. When your brothers and sisters have children, you have to be a faithful uncle to your nieces and nephews. And when your children have children, you have to be a faithful grandfather, a papa to your grandchildren. That is fulfilling your purpose. Those of us who are, those of you who are girls, who are females, to, to honor God in your family, in God's family, you have to be a faithful daughter to your mother and father. You have to be a faithful sister to your sisters and brothers. When you get married, you're to be a faithful wife to your husband. When you have kids, you're to be a faithful mom to your children. When your children have children, you have to be a faithful nana to your grandchildren. And when your brothers and sisters have children, you have to be a faithful auntie to your nieces and nephews. And when you do that, you're honoring God in family relationships. And when you honor God in family relationships, he'll take your calling to a whole nother level of service. Does that make sense? 
Here's some scriptural support. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And here's the promise. That it, it may go well with you, that's in, refresh, in reference to your calling, and you may live long on the earth. That in relation to how long you live a good and healthy life. Whenever we dishonor family relationships, we dishonor God. And can I back up for just a moment and pause for station identification and say that that commandment to honor our mother and father does not have an expiration date. As long as you are alive, you are to honor your mother and father as long as they're alive, but even in their death, you should honor their legacy. So there's no expiration date on honoring mother and father. Whether we are, when we are unfaithful in family relationships, we are unfaithful to God and we remove the blessing of that it may go well with you off of our careers. It, it's, it's whenever we uh, are dishonoring to God, we remove the blessing of longevity, long life when we dishonor family relationships. So faithfulness and family purpose is a prerequisite to receiving your calling. God cannot trust his sons and daughters who are not faithful in family relationships with a divine assignment because family culture listens to this, teaches us stewardship, it teaches obedience, and family is where we learn, where we learn respect for authority. It is within family that we, res- we learn how to respect our peers by the way we treat our brothers and sisters. It is in family that we, re- we learn faithfulness in a community where we learn citizenship and patriotism. It's all taking place within the context of family. If you have not discovered your calling, more than likely, it is due to a history of unreconciled, broken, or unfaithful relationship within the context of your family. Or if you know what your calling is, but you know you're not thriving in your calling, you know there's another level that you can get to that you just are not able to get to no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, chances are it's due to a broken unreconciled relationship with a family member. And listen, I'm talking from experience right here. Once you reconcile the broken relationship or relationships within your family, God will take your career to a whole nother level of service and blessing. Can I get amen, brothers and sisters? So if you're unfaithful in your purpose, listen, you will miss your calling. If Jesus had not fulfilled his purpose as a son, he would have missed his calling as a savior. It was his obedience to his mother Mary at the wedding at Cana where he actually walked into his calling. Remember at the wedding when they ran out of the wine and Mary found out about it and she said, this is not good. She went to Jesus and she said, hey, we out of wine. (laughs) Jesus said this, woman, my time has not come. Now, Jesus had special favor because if I'd have said that to my mama, woman, my time hadn't come. I'd have got a whipping. I'm telling you, I'd have got the worst. But Mary just insisted, no, you're going to turn this water into wine. And when he was obedient to his mother, the scripture says it launched him into his calling, his ministry. Listen, God only blesses those with a divine assignment who are faithful to their family. Here's the last point, the significance of destiny. To fulfill our destiny, we must be faithful to God's plan, our destiny. The text explains God planned our calling and our purpose before the foundation of the earth. Predestination means that he planned every day of our life from beginning to end before we were even born. In Psalm 139, verse 16, David said it this way, all the days of our lives were written in your book before even one of them came to be. Fulfilling God's plan is known as destiny. And destiny, listen to this, is what will happen in the life of a son or daughter of God in spite of any effort to stop it. God not only planned what he wanted us to do, he planned what he wanted us to be, and he planned for our success and tenure. All things, all things work together for good 
to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, even the bad things work together for good. Of course, after 34 years of faithful service, my childhood dream come true to, became a, to become a firefighter came true in 1981. I became a firefighter. My dream came true. And the favor of God was just on my life. I, in, in four years, I became a captain. It usually takes 12 to 15 years. And 10 years, I was an assistant chief. It usually takes about 20 years. And in 19 years on the Shreveport Fire Department, I became the fire chief of the Shreveport Fire Department. Eight years later, the mayor of Atlanta, Mayor Shirley Franklin, called me, recruited me to come to Atlanta. I didn't even have to put in an application. I went to Atlanta to serve as the fire chief under Mayor Shirley Franklin. Two years later, President Obama gets elected and appoints me to the highest fire official office in the United States of America, the United States Fire Administration. Now here I am, a little boy, growing up in well, on welfare and food stamps on the front porch of a shotgun house, eating mayonnaise sandwiches and drinking sugar water and had a dream to become a firefighter one day, now the highest fire official in the country. Nobody but our God can do that. That's part of God's plan. So God's plan also included me going back to Atlanta. And I was serving for five years and God put it on my heart because of my passion for men's ministry to write a book to address Christian men who still struggle with our carnal nature, which is all of us, by the way. And the book was called, Who Told You That You Were Naked? Now, those of you who haven't connected the question with Genesis chapter 3, verse 11, probably just said, well, man, no wonder you got fired. <laughs> but that's the question God asked Adam in the Garden of Eden. Well, in the book, there was about four paragraphs because Christian men still struggle with sexual sin. I wanted to talk about sex from a biblical perspective. And so I talked about in the book of Genesis how God made male and he made female. He wanted them to procreate, to have children. And they, the man left his woman and cleaved cleave to his wife and they become one flesh and they begin to have other sons and daughters of God. And that if you have sexual relationships outside of that, it is a sin. And that is what caused my 34-year childhood dream come true to come to an end. But my destiny didn't come to an end. God used that bad experience to take my destiny to a whole nother level. Those books sold by the thousands after I got fired. After I got fired, my ministry, my con contribution to men's ministry went to a whole nother level. I began to speak at men's meetings all over the country. I was fired from being the fire chief of Atlanta, but I was appointed to be the chief operating officer of Elizabeth Baptist Church in Atlanta, so I was still a chief. And then a few weeks ago, God used a law firm that defended my case after four years that brought vindication to my situation. He actually caused them to appoint me as a senior fellow and vice president of Alliance Defending Freedom. And all of that was because it was God's destiny on my life. Mayor Kasim Reed, as honorable and respectful as I am towards him, he did not control my destiny. Right. My destiny was in the hand of God. So what do we say to all these things? That's a question later on in this same chapter. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As, is, as, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor future, nor any powers, neither height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All things work together for good. As ex has a exclusive distinction when it's referencing people in that particular passage. All things work together for good, specifically for those who love God, those who are the called 
according to his purpose. And if you're in that group, your destiny cannot be stopped by anybody. You will fulfill your calling. You will do things exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think in your family, your purpose, and in your calling, in your profession. And you will leave a legacy of faith and righteousness for the next generation in your family. And you will leave a legacy of righteousness and faithfulness in your profession. However, listen carefully. If you change your purpose, what God created you to be, you will not fulfill your calling. And if you miss your calling, you will not fulfill your destiny. And if you don't fulfill your destiny, you will not leave a legacy of faith and righteousness for the next generation of your family and the next generation of your profession, your firefighters or police officers or whatever your profession might be. God wants us to use our callings to serve in such a manner, brothers and sisters, that we set a standard for everyone who will serve in our position after we promote higher or after we retire. David, King David, set a standard for kings in Israel even years and years and years after David had died. They were at the end of the life of a king of Israel or Judah, it would say, and he either did as his father David did or he did not do as David had done. He set a standard. What am I trying to say? God wants us to be standard setters in our professions for his glory. And if you're not in the group that are the called according to his purpose, I can tell you how to get in the group. You can get in the group today. And there's only one word you need to know about the invitation to the group, the call, Jesus. Jesus is how you get in to the group of the call. Jesus himself lived it out before us so that we can see. Jesus was a faithful son to his purpose. He was a faithful savior to his calling. And in his destiny, he fulfilled it as king of kings and Lord of lords. And if you are here today and you don't have Jesus as the center of your purpose, the center of your calling and the center of your destiny, you don't have to leave here today with that. All of us can say as Jesus did on the cross, it is finished. And the reason why Jesus was able to say it is finished is because he fulfilled all the prophecies that had been spoken of him. And at that moment, Jesus was saying, I have fulfilled all the purposes of God in my life. Here's the final thought. And I'm going to share it with you from a personal perspective. I don't know how long I'm going to live. But one thing I do know, I am not going to die until I have fulfilled all the purposes of God in my life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, how we praise you and thank you for the joy of your holy word and for the truths that are spoken in it from Genesis to Revelation how it is inerrant, infallible, immutable, and it is authoritative. We rejoice in the fact that before the foundation of the world, you predestined us to be sons and daughters. You had a purpose for us, and you predestined us to a calling, a divine assignment. So, Father, we have, we surrender ourselves today to that old, wonderful spiritual that hymn we used to sing back in the day. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Bless the public safety officers in Rocky Mountain and all over this nation. Bless those who are still grieving from the losses of their loved ones on September 11, 2001. Father, bless those who are living alive to carry on their legacy. Pray that you'll bless the families of first responders that are here today at Rocky Mount. Encourage and strengthen their heart because sometimes they don't know whether they're going to come home at the end of the shift. But let them be encouraged that we don't know how long they're going to live. But if their hand is in Jesus' hands, we know that they're not going to die. 
until they have fulfilled all the purposes that you have for their life. We give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.